I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 is our text today. And if you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1165 and you will find our text and be able to follow along. It's page 1165. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know uh, God wants to speak to you. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, ask for one. We'd be glad to get you a Bible. Uh, and, and because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, just uh, to echo uh, what uh, Pastor Robert said, we have, uh, you know, our Next Step classes tomorrow afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, and, uh, and, and, and while the intro grow and serve classes are at 6 o'clock, and I would love for you to take those, I have to invite you to take lead at 3 o'clock with me because <laughs> I'm teaching it, and, and we've already got a great crowd signed up, but if you've been wondering why Calvary does what it does, and you want to connect, then, then by all means, uh, you know, sign up, show up, we'll, we'll make room for you, we'll add you to that list. But uh, uh, I'm just I I passing out that invitation. You go, well, I I'm gonna take intro, I'm gonna take grow, I'm gonna take serve at six, can I take both of them? Yes, you can, I'll talk fast, okay? So uh, it it's just an invitation, but whatever you need to take, take the next step, okay? Please do that. And the other thing I want to mention is that on uh, June the 3rd at 9 o'clock in the morning, it's a Saturday, uh, we're having our annual church business meeting. And I'm mentioning it now uh, because it's a long way out. And you're going, why are you mentioning it so far out? Because this year we're going to be talking about some of the things that we need to do uh, in terms of our next steps as a church regarding building and how we're going to add more seats and how we're going to continue to expand as we're reaching more people. I don't know if you guys noticed this year, it was kind of kind of filling up. Uh, you know, even Saturday night got full, but all of our services were showing the signs of where. So we're planning on continuing to reach people to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So we're going to talk about building and what that looks like going forward. And uh, and as a church, we need uh, approval by our congregation before we uh, expend monies in those ways. So uh, I'm just inviting you to that meeting and also uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on our church constitution that tells us uh, what we do. And if you go, what do you talk about church constitution and all this kind of stuff? Well, come to the intro class and find out about it tomorrow night. Okay, because uh, that's what uh, you'll find out about it. Hey, uh, we are talking about kingdom relationships. Okay, kingdom relationships, the whole idea that if we choose to live according to God's rules, according to God's plan, according to God's covenant, it has tremendous benefits for you and all of the people you have relationships with. So some of you are going, why does he have an umbrella? You're about to find out. The, uh, it's not just because I think a cane would be cool and I, I didn't have one, so I grabbed an umbrella. If it's raining and you have an umbrella, uh, would you just stand there in the rain? Is there anyone who just like, I'm just gonna stand there in the rain, I have an umbrella? No, so if it's raining, you would uh, probably decide that you're gonna open up the umbrella, right? And you're gonna stand under that umbrella so that it does what? <laughs> Keeps you dry, right? I know, this looks silly, and some of you are like, you're not supposed to open umbrellas inside, that's bad luck. By the way, in case you hadn't heard, karma is crap, and I don't believe in luck, okay? God is in charge of us. We don't have to follow those silly, superstitious rules about anything. So, uh, so anyway, if you're in the rain and you open this up, it does not stop it from raining. It stops it from raining on you. It doesn't change what's going on outside of the umbrella. It simply changes the effect of what's happening around you on you, and because I golf and I have a golf umbrella, it's a big honking umbrella, isn't it? So, you know, several of you could join me under this umbrella, and not only would I benefit from the umbrella and staying dry, but so would the people close to me. Uh, we live in a world that is full of just uh, disgusting perversion and, and filth and destruction, and uh, we can't, stop that from happening, but we can stop it from happening in our lives. 
And if we choose to live God's way in our relationships, it's like this umbrella. We, we don't change what's happening in the world, but we change what's happening to us. We, we're not affected by it in the same way because we're living under God's covenant, under God's blessings, under God's plans for our life and for the way we're relating. And guess what? Those blessings for us, those protections for us, they spill over to the people who are closest to us in our relationships. And, and that's why we're teaching you about relationships and about what God says about relationships because if we'll apply it to our lives, it'll be like an umbrella in the rain. It won't stop the rain, but it'll keep you from experiencing uh, wetness in that case. So now I get, to get rid of the umbrella. But uh, I hope that makes sense to you because that's what the basis of what we're talking about this weekend is. It is just the whole idea of God's uh, relational plan for us. So Philippians chapter two, verses one through 11, the Apostle Paul shares one of the great passages uh, about relationships, specifically about Jesus and how he relates to us and how he related to the Father in this plan. So listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, let me pause there. Is there? Yes. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Is there any comfort from love? Are you guys participating in the Holy Spirit? Yes. Okay. Any affection and sympathy at all? Yes. Oh, a lot less people are sympathetic. <laughs> okay. All right. Since the answer is yes, then everything that follows applies to us. So listen, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, I just want to tell you that embracing the mind of Christ will result in healthy relationships. You want the umbrella effect on your relationships in life, then you need to embrace the mind of Christ. And, and this entire passage, I think, hinges on verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Other translations put it, have the same attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, or have the same mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ. In other words, have the mind of Jesus and it will impact everything. So the verses before verse five explain our path to healthy uh, uh, Jesus-minded relationships. It, it just kind of lays it out. The verses following the, the verse five show us Jesus' example of sacrifice and humility and submission and obedience to the Father's plan. So this teaching applies to followers of Jesus, okay? If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, if you believe that, that you, know, you have made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you need to have the same mind as Jesus. The same mind of Christ, what we're talking about. And, and that means that you have the same love for Jesus. Doesn't mean you have the same love for music or the same love for pizza or the same love for it has means you have the same love for your savior who gave himself for you it, it means that you're in full accord this is all verse two that that you agree on this that jesus is your savior that what we just shared that he's the one and only son of god savior of the world uh and that we have one mind which is focused on the mission of christ one mind not 
all agreeing about everything, but we are focused on the mission of Christ. And if we get to that point, if we agree that, okay, this is who we are as followers of Jesus, okay? Then he says, well, first, verse three and four, I think, begin to reveal the mind of Christ and what it looks like. The first thing we see about the mind of Christ is that we think of others first. If you want to embrace the mind of Christ, think of others first. Uh, Look at verse 3 and 4 again. You ought to memorize it, but just look at it. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Don't be selfish. Isn't that what he says? Do nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Don't be selfish. Don't think of yourself first. And he goes on to say, don't be conceited. Don't worry about yourself. Don't worry about your reputation. Don't worry about your status. But in humility, that's like Jesus, isn't it? Who who was in the form of God, but didn't consider equality with God something to be held onto, but instead he humbled himself and became obedient as a servant. Obedient to the point of death. So he humbled himself. So in humility, in other words, in being like Jesus, Count others more significant or more important than yourself. Wow. That's what it means to think of others first. And can I just tell you that as a follower of Jesus, this is the battle you will face in your life. As a follower of Jesus, this is a battle that you're going to face and maybe the most difficult battle because we are sinful people. All of us have sinned, come short of the glory of God. All of us uh, are unrighteous. There's not one of us who's righteous, not even one. So we we all have this sin nature that is by, not by design, but by default, it is selfish. I'm a selfish person. Are you a selfish person? Yes, I am. So if if you didn't answer yes, if you're not sure about it, then that just definitely means you are. Uh, (laughs) No, I mean, look, you do selfless things. You act against your nature, but our natural disposition, because we're sinners, is selfishness. And Jesus confronts this. I mean, he just challenges this. Because we're always thinking, hey, how will this impact me? What's it going to cost me? What's it going to benefit me? What's in it for me? And Jesus says, if you're my follower, that's not how we do life. That's not my people. We do it differently. We think of others first. Now, this is an affront to our radical self-idolatry that thrives on selfishness and conceit. Our world is wrapped up in selfishness and conceit. Uh, And and we just have to decide, hey, am I going to listen to Jesus? Am I going to embrace Jesus? Am am I going to trust Jesus enough to think of putting others first Or am I going to keep living for myself? Now, just so you know, this is not a rebuke of self-care and healthy boundaries. uh, Because if you're healthy, you can care for others. If you're unhealthy, you can't. Uh, But anything you use as an excuse to ignore the needs of others is is selfishness. And and if you want a, a picture of what it looks like to think of others first... You just saw it in the, you know, in the welcome time in that video of us serving in Mexico. And I say us because, you know, hey, it's part of Calvary and Calvary is all about radical service and and where we believe that the the love of Christ is best expressed through acts of kindness and service. And that's, that's who we are. And so we go when we do that because why? Because we're thinking of others first. Nobody in that group had to go and build a house in the slums of Mexico. And some of you are thinking, well, isn't it dangerous in Mexico? Yeah, but there's a lot of people who live there and need help. And and we have to consider others as more important than ourselves. So um, embracing the mind of Christ means thinking of others first, and it means think of we, not me. Think we, not me. Um, I know it sounds a lot like the first point, but it's really not. We, as followers of Jesus, are the body of Christ. 
The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 says that we're all part of one body and the body has many members and yet all are one. And he says we all are members of the body of Christ. We don't have the same task, we don't have the same abilities, we don't have the same responsibilities, but we have a responsibility to the body, we are one. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter says, hey, you know what we are? We are living stones being built into God's temple. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you're a stone in God's temple. And Jesus is the cornerstone of that temple. And, and we're all being built together into God's house. You know what that means? That means we are one in Christ. We are connected by the Holy Spirit who makes us one in Christ. By the way, if you're a follower of Jesus, then God put his Holy Spirit in you the moment you confess Jesus as Lord. And the Holy Spirit indwells you. And he claims you for Jesus. And he guarantees your salvation. He convicts you of sin. He teaches you truth. He does all these things. But he also makes us one. Because the same Holy Spirit in me is the same Holy Spirit that is in you. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4. By the way, if you want to flip over, it's like two pages back. In your Bibles, 1161, if you want to flip there. Uh, he's it, just beginning in verse one. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, because he was in prison, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That means following Jesus. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Because there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Hey, can I just ask you, is there a number that describes us to the Apostle Paul? What's that number? You guys didn't get it? One. We're one. Did you not notice that? We're one. We're one family. We're one body, one spirit, one building. We're all in this together. One Lord, one hope, one faith, one baptism. It's one. Why? Because we're all united in Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. If we're all united in Jesus Christ, you can't win if I lose. I can't win if you lose. Either we win or we lose together. You guys know I'm a football fan, a baseball fan, I'm a basketball fan. The Suns are getting ready to play right now. <laughs> and the playoffs. No individual on a team wins if the team loses. We are in this together. And either we win or we lose. And in all your relationships with the people that you love, the same principle applies. This is why we think of others first so that we can win. Again, I told you this is an affront to our selfishness. But if you'll listen to Jesus, if you'll trust Jesus, the benefits of following Jesus are amazing in your life. If you think of others first, you can win. Because you're helping them to win. So if you're married... You can't win if your spouse loses. Maybe you're feeling really good because you won the argument. You lost. You lost. I mean, you have a discussion. You guys can figure out who's less wrong about a subject. That's fine. But, but if you're actually looking at this like you won and they lost, and, and then you lose. You lose. It, you know, uh, put your spouse first. So that you can win. If you have children, you can't win if your children lose. See, that's why you put your kids first, which often means, you know, discipline them and have boundaries for them, uh, you know, and putting down your phones and talking to them. It, you know, if you're a single adult, you can't win if your family and friends that are in your life lose. That's why we need to think differently. We need to think of others first. We need to think of we, not me. It's not like, well, I'm doing fine. Everybody else doesn't matter. So we reflect the mind of Christ because if we reflect the mind of Christ, we can follow the actions of Jesus. If we don't reflect the mind of Christ, we're going to fail at following Jesus. Do, do you get that? If you fail at following Jesus, your relationships are going to suffer because you're going to be out in the rain without an umbrella. 
If you embrace the mind of Jesus, then you can follow the actions of Jesus and you have a chance to have the blessings of Jesus fill your life in the same way that God wants to bless you. So let's talk about applying the mind of Christ in our relationships. Let's get real practical and talk about what that looks like in our relationships to apply the mind of Jesus. Just practical steps to thinking of others first and working for the win of we, not me. First of all, if you want to apply the mind of Christ in your relationships, you got to value people. you got to value spouse people, friend people, value family people, value work people, even value stranger people. Some of you are going to say, there's no one stranger than my family, so how do I do that? <laughs> See, here's the thing. You can't love people that you don't value. You just can't. But we know that people are made in God's image. We know that they are valued by Jesus because his, he gave his life to save people. Right? That's what he gave his life to do is to redeem people, people like me and you. And, and we know that the great commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. ourselves. Consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also their interests. So value people. See other people as, as those who are loved dearly by God, who are valued by God, who are created by God and gifted by God, and then identify and celebrate their giftedness and contributions instead of always pointing out their flaws or focusing on your differences and how you're right and they're wrong. Now, obviously, the, hopefully, it's obvious that this starts with people who are closest to you and extends outward. So, uh, husbands, if you value your wife, stop critiquing her flaws continually. Wives, if you value your husband, stop focusing on their failures. Parents, if you value your children, celebrate what they do well and right. Don't just point out what they do wrong. And if you value friends, why don't you ask how they're doing and actually listen? So here's a question, and, and, and I really want you to wrestle with this. Uh, and this may be the question that you wrestle with, uh, you know, uh, if the first stuff hasn't already gotten you there. How do you see people? When, when you are doing your day, how do you actually see the people in your day? Do you see them as obstacles to what you want? Do you see them as objects that you can use? Or do you see them as opportunities to bless in Jesus' name? Because almost all relationships fit in one of those categories. Obstacles to what you want, objects that you can use, or opportunities that you can bless. If you desire healthy relationships, embrace the mind of Christ and value people. And forgive people. Forgive people. I mean, by the way, uncomfortable grace is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that we should give the same incredible, uh, uh, limitless grace that we have received from Christ. We should give that to others. We should make it available to others and let them live in that as well. So, um, so forgive people. Forgive spouse people. Forgive friend people. Forgive family people. Forgive ex-spouse people. Yeah. See, this isn't the you know, easy part. This is the hard part. If you have relationships, people will offend you. It's a guarantee people are going to offend you. They're going to hurt you. They're gonna, sometimes they're going to offend you accidentally. Sometimes they're going to do it on purpose. But they're going to offend you. And Jesus constantly preached and modeled forgiveness. And he did it for our spiritual health and for our relationships to thrive. And so we know as Jesus followers that we're to forgive as we've been forgiven. You guys know that? Some of you know that. Some of you are like still wrestling with that. How do I see people? But this is especially power, uh, powerful when you apply this principle to relationships. When you look at it in terms of relationships and how it's gonna impact your relationships, forgiveness is huge. Um, one of the dangers we have in relationships is that we keep score. I don't know if you're a scorekeeper or not, but you might be if you bring up the past when you're arguing, if you remind people of how many times they've let you down or broken their promises. 
Um, might be if you're trying to win for yourself instead of for the relationship. Um, unforgiveness is ugly. It's destructive to relationships. And, and basically, unforgiveness is the ultimate me, not we. It's kind of anti-Jesus. Another danger is that um, we're just silent in our pain. You're in a relationship and you're getting lots of uh, offenses your way, but you're just toughing it out. You're just bearing it quietly, but uh, never communicating how you feel and you just grow more and more resentful day after day after day. So if you want healthy relationships, forgive. And forgiveness is not abstract. It is personal and it's real and it's to people. So forgive, forgive the big stuff, forgive the small stuff, forgive the repeated stuff. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean lack of accountability. It means your soul isn't carrying the anger towards others. So um, try to practice grace before it's needed. Uh, now, I've, I've talked about this before, but uh, I like the term preemptive grace. Uh, you know, if you're gonna have uh, preemptive warfare, it means you attack your enemy before they attack you. And, and so uh, I just took that into the forgiveness thing and, and give grace before your, uh, the other people offend you. Just go ahead and decide, I'm gonna give grace before they offend you. It's kind of like putting on a you know, bodysuit of grace so that they can't hurt you. Just try it. Just go, hey, wake up in the morning, go, I'm gonna forgive before I'm offended and see how that changes your day. Uh, another term that I heard, and I really liked it, so I'm gonna steal it and adopt it, or if you don't like preemptive grace, try premeditated mercy. <laughs> yeah, premeditated mercy. Just go ahead and decide you're gonna plan and execute mercy on people. So, you know, if you like that, just go, hey, someone's gonna, they're gonna offend me, and instead of jumping down their throat, just go, I'm gonna pour mercy on their head. See, think about it. Preemptive grace, premeditated mercy, I don't care which term you like, just, you know, Forgive people, because if you're constantly focusing on mercy instead of payback, all of your relationships are gonna benefit. So value people, forgive people, and serve people. I've already mentioned radical service. Serve spouse people, serve friend people, serve family people, serve people, all people. Put the needs of others first. Hey, did I mention we had a serve class tomorrow night at six o'clock? And, and you might want to take it because it talks about what we mean when we talk about serving. And it does a deep dive in the biblical uh, understanding of serve and how we apply that here at Calvary. Uh, the question people often ask is, well, if I'm thinking of others, then who's going to take care of me? Who's going to take care of me? That's a selfish question, by the way. But the selfish answer is, well, you know what? I'll take care of myself. But if you do that, if you say, I'm going to put me first and I'm going to take care of me how many people are taking care of you? One, you. You're making sure you're taken care of. But if you trust Jesus and you go with his answer, which is, hey, I'm gonna take care of others and not worry about me, and if we you know, uh, do that, then your needs will be met by many instead of only you. You go, what do you mean, they'll be met by many? What if we all, as the people of God, decided we were gonna put others first and, and look after their needs before we look after our own needs and we all started taking care of each other's needs and then suddenly you wouldn't re you'd realize, I don't have to take care of my own needs because there's so many people taking care of me. It'd be annoying at some level. <laughs> but wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if we became such a, a loving, caring community that the world took notice and they went, wow, these people really live differently. They really treat each other differently. I want to be a part of that. Don't you think that's part of Jesus' master plan? Is that the, the, the church, which is his body, which is his temple, is a place of such love and care and, and, you know, and affection for one another that people are drawn to be a part of it because of the way that we love one another? Man, if we all embrace that mind of Christ and serve each other, you know, the world would take notice and show up. That's the kingdom of God that gets the attention of a world that doesn't care about God. So value people, forgive people, serve people, and encourage people. Encourage spouse people. Encourage children people. Encourage friend people. 
Encourage family people, encourage working people, encourage public servant people, even when they stop you and want to write you a ticket. I dare you. Thank the officer for doing his job. See, I, I kind of like the saying, words create worlds, but I think it's true. Words create worlds. And, and uh, here's the reality. Your words are creating the world you live in. Your words are creating the world that you're living in. Whether it is a dark, dismal place or a joy-filled, hopeful place, your words are creating that world. Uh, your words are creating a world of health, healing, and encouragement or a world of hurt, negativity, and despair. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says that. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, one of my favorite Proverbs. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Words create worlds. This world is a difficult place for everyone, so choose to encourage people. And if you encourage people, that means that people believe that you are for them, not against them. That you're not adversarial, you are a proponent for them. And, and by the way, you are actually for the people that you meet. Can I just frame this so that if you, if you can put all of this together? You're actually for the people you meet because they're either on your team and you want them to win because if they win, you win, or you're recruiting them for the team. Right? They're the mission. So they're either family or their mission, and the mission is for them to become family. And so you really do want them to succeed. You really are for them. You want to help them succeed in life. You want to help them win their battles. So, again, if you're married, encourage your spouse. Remember, if they win, you win. If you have children, please encourage your kids. First of all, encourage them to follow Jesus. But also just encourage them to have courage, to laugh, to forgive, and, and just to persevere, to try and try again. And for everyone you meet, choose to bless people because you're going to reap what you sow, and I want blessings, so I'm going to encourage people. Um, look, this is the mind of Christ. This is who he is and this is who he's calling us to be. And, and if you want to celebrate daily the benefits of living under his blessings and under his covenant, then decide you're going to think differently, you're going to act like Jesus, and you and all your relationships will benefit tremendously. Will you pray with me? Father, your plans are so good and if we follow your word, if we trust you, if we obey you, you're never gonna let us down because you're gonna lead us to life and hope and peace. You're gonna be with us through the turmoil and the struggles and the illnesses and the battles. You're gonna give us peace that passes understanding and hope. Most of all, you're gonna fill our lives with people who love us and bless us. And so God, as we talk about kingdom relationships, deepen our relationship with you. We invite your spirit to move, just to speak to our lives. Show us where we're not encouraging. Show us where we're not forgiving. Show us how we're being selfish. Show us how we're devaluing people, God, and we will repent and we will follow Jesus because he is the one who gives life and he is the one who shows us how to live. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.